This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk and financial solutions. Bundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. Marcus Gazzardi from Cooper Investors, thanks very much for coming on Talk Your Book. I thought it'd be a good place to start if you walked us through a little bit about Cooper Investors philosophy. Yeah, for sure. So Cooper Investors, um, we've been around for 20 years. We do one thing, long only equities. We manage $14 billion across both global and Australian domestic equities markets. But wherever we are investing, it's the same investment process and philosophy. So that process is very qualitative led. It's not to say that we ignore the numbers. Of course, there's table stakes in investing, but our experience and observation is where we've been able to create value is on that qualitative side, you know, company management teams, cultures, business strategy, and how it sort of comes together. And I guess to summarize it, what we're really looking for are patterns or behaviors that we've seen create value previously and then emerging in a new or similar situation. And that's when we get excited. That's often what creates the bedrock of an investment proposition for us. And before we get into your stock specific idea, there's a fair bit of turmoil in, in global markets at the minute. How are you feeling about that more broadly? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, we see the panic, we see people stocking up the shelves and running out of toilet paper and things like that. But for an investor like us, a patient investor, um, this is when we start looking at our lips as, you know, wonderful companies that we've been following that perhaps we couldn't get our heads around in terms of valuation. Now they're looking really attractive. And so for an investor like us, like us, this is actually when we get to work and we get to, you know, make some of those investments that can drive the portfolio over the next sort of three to five years. And what stock do you want to talk about today? Yeah, so I thought I'd talk about um, a stock from our global equities fund. It's a US technology business, but perhaps one that most of your audience isn't as familiar with. You know, we've been traveling and visiting the US for, you know, well over a decade now, and we've built up this network of software and technology businesses that sit below the, you know, the trillion dollar market cap businesses that take up so much of the column inches in the financial press. So I thought I'd talk about a business called PTC. They're headquartered in Boston, listed on the ticker PTC. And best to think of them as a provider of mission critical software to the manufacturing and industrial industries. And what are their different business units? Yeah, so PTC have sort of two key business or businesses or products. It's best to think about them as discrete areas, but they are serving the same customers, just different opportunities within those customers. So first off, where PTC's heritage is, is in their design software business, which is CAD or computer aid design, as people may know it. Now, this is a really wonderful business, very sticky customer relationships. You can imagine an engineer has probably been trained on PTC software since he was at university. Very unlikely for them to then suddenly decide to switch to another provider. Now, what engineers are doing is they're using PTC software to create digital blueprints of you know, cars or engines or pieces of equipment that will eventually be um, produced in the real world. It's a nice industry. It's growing to 6 or 7%. And because of the sticky relationships, the profit pools tend to be pretty attractive as well. Now, this is the core engine of PTC, the majority of revenues and profits today. The second part of PTC's business is their efficiency software, selling to those same manufacturing customers. So probably best to think about this as an example. There's a few different things in there which we can get into. But imagine a piece of equipment sitting on a factory floor. You know, up until recently, that piece of equipment may have been installed in the production line, say it's a pump. You know, it would be running and if it broke down, maybe it would be repaired or if it failed, it would be replaced. Now with Internet of Things technology, there's so much more real time data we can get off that piece of equipment, sort of, you know, uh, how much fluid's passing through it, whether it's running hot or cold, whether it's making a funny noise. Now, with all that real time data, there's heaps of interesting stuff we can do. We can design the product better next time. We can do predictive maintenance. We can do remote monitoring of the product. We can change the sales and marketing process. But the point here is it's PTC software that's driving all these insights and it's a really exciting area. It's growing 30 to 40% for them. And so we, when we combine those two businesses, the design business and this fast growing efficiency software piece, we see a structural lift in PTC's growth rate from you know, mid to high single digits to a mid teens rate. And augmented reality is the other part yeah. of that, that second business unit yeah. that potentially going to experience really significant growth rates. Yeah. Can you talk us through some of the, maybe the top down forecast for growth in augmented reality yeah. and what PTC could hopefully experience there as well. Yeah, so P this market is growing phenomenally fast. It's very early and 
and this is often what you see in sort of Nissan technology. So, you know, I think PTC are posting growth rates. It's basically doubling every year, which is, you know, of course, very, very attractive. Um, PTC have a very unique partnership. So people might be familiar with the Microsoft HoloLens. The software that runs that in an industrial setting, that's, that's PTC software. So we think that's a really good franking of the, P the quality of the PTC um, software and business. Use cases, well, imagine in an industrial setting, perhaps in that example I described earlier with the pump needing repairing. If a technician comes along and they've never seen that pump or they've never worked on it before, perhaps in the past they would have had to you know, find the manual or work out what part needs to be replaced. Well, today, they can put on a pair of hollow lens and have it overlaid in real time, in, real, in the real world environment, all the information they need to know about that pump, what piece is broken, what you know, screw to, screw to unwind to, to pull out the necessary part and replace the new one. Heaps and heaps of efficiency gains here that just weren't possible you know, just three or four years ago. And when you look at the evaluation from a, a cash flow perspective, it's yeah. significantly more attractive than a lot of other tech companies. They've yeah. actually got free cash flow for starters. <laughs> yeah. And they're speaking a lot about the importance of uh, annual recurring revenues and yeah. getting them up. Yeah. Maybe talk us through some of the metrics around their free cash flow and if you think the increase in recurring revenues is going to change that valuation gap. Yeah, so a couple of moving parts there. I guess first one to start with is the history. I mentioned, you know, PTC have been in the design software space for 30 to 40 years, they actually invented CAD. That business has very attractive profit pools and free cash flow profiles. But what's happened with PTC over the last two or three years They've transitioned the bottle model from selling upfront, chunky, perpetual licenses to a subscription model. And if you think about what that is, previously maybe you sold a license for $1,000 and in three or four years, the customer could choose to upgrade or not when they were ready to the new version. Now they send them a check for, they send them an invoice every quarter or every year um, and they sell the software on a subscription basis. The twist here is that while you go through that period, by definition, your revenues have to go backwards. Of course, your cost base does, doesn't really change. And so margins, earnings, free cash flow becomes depressed. So when you look at the most recently reported numbers, the actual underlying economics of the business, despite being you know, improved with a more you know, stable and sticky revenue base, it looks like they're going backwards. So the trick here with PTC is to let these, this transition mature and let the growth that we're talking about in these efficiency softwares really come through. So you've got to look beyond the typical Wall Street timeframe, you know, three, four years out, say 2024. Um, this is a business that we think will be growing the top line at you know, 15, 16%. Um, that subscription model will have matured. And so the margin profile will look significantly different. We think they can be generating you know, 35, maybe even 40% operating margins with a gross margin of you know, like software businesses, 85, 90%. What all that means is for free cash flow, we've got an $800 million free cash flow business or more, we think. Now, that compares very favorably to the 250 million, 260 million dollars they're generating today. So that's the kicker here. When we look at P2C's market cap of nine billion dollars, or a bit less, uh, you know, at the close last night, we think a business with that financial profile, a software business with that financial profile, won't be trading anywhere near a nine billion dollar market cap in three or four years. And that's the value latency we see. And what's the balance sheet look like? So they have got a little bit of debt. They've recently done an acquisition. I mean, nothing significant. And again probably gearing metrics are a little bit distorted given depression that they're currently experiencing with their earnings before the subscription inflection, but again, very strong balance sheet and nothing to worry about there. Are there other opportunities where you could see them potentially acquiring? I mean, historically under the current um, CEO, Jim Heppelman, they have made some very, very smart acquisitions. I mean, we talked about the efficiency software and you know, when he was buying these assets three or four years ago, there were other people in the market laughing at him thinking, you know, what are you doing? And now they're a core growth engine for the business. So it wouldn't be unheard of a PTC looking to acquire new technologies and um, additional efficiency solutions that they can tack on to their current suite of software offerings for sure. And you mentioned Jim Helperman. Yeah. He's the president and the CEO. I'm yeah. also the president and CEO of Christian Invest. Yeah. I'm also the only employee. <laughs> yeah. But it's an unusual structure to yeah. see someone have dual roles yeah. in Australia. You yeah. mentioned off-air before and they've also got an independent chairman. Yeah. But how do you get comfortable when someone is often president and CEO or sits on the board and is also manager of a company? What's yeah. your preference? No, I mean, I think, you know, it depends. And I know that's sort of an unsatisfying answer. I think, you know, as your base case, you want to have those checks and balances in place, independent chairman, well-structured board, you know, and a management team that can go about and execute and be held accountable to the board. Um, and that's certainly the case at, at PTC. Um, I think, you know, for Jim specifically, he's got a fantastic track record at PTC. He actually joined the company 22 years ago through an acquisition 
uh, of a business that he co-founded. And now that software is actually one of PPC's most, most important products. Best to think of him as a, you know, obviously he's an entrepreneur. Um, he's a mechanical engineer by training. So he's got really deep product knowledge and he understands exactly what customers need and where their pain points are and how to position PTC accordingly. I mean, we've gone and visited him multiple times at the headquarters in Boston. And, you know, you come with your prepared questions and you have a great discussion with him, but, you know, it's very common for him to jump up halfway through the meeting and start scribbling things on whiteboards and really explaining how he sees the world. And his passion is really, you know, it's palpable, it's sort of, you know, seeping out of his pores and that's what gets us so excited about him. And what, what are some of the things you'll be keeping an eye at to potentially change your mind? either for, for good and wanting to buy more or, or for bad and, and looking to exit a company like this? Yeah, so, I mean, I guess it's pretty topical at the moment with coronavirus and what this means for, you know, economic growth and supply chains and things like that. So PTC are fairly well positioned, I guess, first off from the perspective that most of their resources are software programmers and developers that sit in their Boston headquarters. So, you know, no direct impacts from coronavirus there but their customers are industrials and manufacturing companies that are obviously going to be affected and potentially face you know, cyclical demand profiles. So how do we get comfort there? Well, first off, I mentioned the transition in that business model from perpetual to subscription. So that provides a nice, nice buffer to, to revenues and hence earnings. And the other thing worth noting is PTC sell into the design and R&D portions of businesses. And so even in recessions, they're very unlikely to cut, cut on this expense. Why? Well, you much, it's much easier to just to close a factory or pull back on marketing because when economic conditions eventually improve, you don't want to be 12 or 18 months behind your peers on product development because that's going to be a much bigger headache than you know, spending a little bit more on R&D through a recession. In terms of other things that we're looking for, uh, is efficiency software, it's a very new technology. PTC are the clear leaders. And the important markers there, and perhaps what will get us even more excited about the stock, is their ability to not only sell this software to new customers, but for those new customers to then move from, I guess, trial or pilots in a single factory or a single division of their company to more broader adoption. And, you know, some of the most recent data out is actually pretty encouraging. I think two thirds of their sales in this business come from existing customers. So we think the proof points are there. And they, in their most recent presentation, they, they did different scenarios for, yeah. you know, I can't remember the terminology, shooting the lights out, you yeah. know, base case. And then if there's a recession, I think yeah. the recession case, it was still 700 million yeah, that's free exactly cash right. flow forecasting. Yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. even with the debt they've got, it's unlikely they're going to be forced into a capital raise. Oh, so no, not at all. Yeah, no. Find themselves, and they're the sort of situations that really make you nervous as Correct. an investor when the downturn yeah, comes. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, this is a, um, you know, when we're investing in technology, we tend to shy away from those businesses that aren't profitable or, you know, maybe the LTV to CAC's nice, but, you know, the free cash flow is negative or zero. I mean, this certainly isn't the case with PTC. I mean, they've, you know, they've been around for 30 or 40 years. They've proven that they can go through cycles and actually they'll be better off in this cycle than they have in any time in the past. You mentioned their long-term value to customer acquisition cost. Yeah. How much more do you want the long-term value of the customer being? to the customer acquisition cost for you to start to go, oh, that's an attractive multiple. Yeah, I mean, those are common metrics and, you know, there's benchmarks out there, I think, you know, over three or four times. I think the first people that started applying that framework, that was perhaps, you know, a pretty novel way to think about some of these newer technology and SaaS mm. businesses. You know, I think increasingly now, it's actually people are getting a little bit lazy and just looking at LTV to CAC and not worrying about sales and marketing and all the other costs yeah. that come with growing a business. It's interesting, you know, in our conversations more broadly across the technology space, it feels like some of these businesses that were perhaps able to just get away with, you know, nice top line growth, 25, 30% and a theoretical LTV to CAC that was satisfactory. The pendulum shifting back to, okay, now investors want, okay, a little bit slower growth, but some, you know, enhanced profitability measures. And, you know, that's actually pretty interesting for us. Maybe, maybe makes us, you know, a little bit more interested in these businesses. Beautiful. Sounds like a great story. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks very much, Chris. Enjoy the chat. Thank you. This episode of Talk Your Book was proudly brought to you by Honan, who go beyond a transactional insurance broker to deliver better outcomes for their clients. If you're enjoying Talk Your Book, make sure you subscribe to Chris Judd Invest.